So as you know, JetBrains has recently introduced a new plugin for IntelliJ IDEA, which aims to offer proper tools for working with big data, and in particular for the people that call themselves data engineers. And while data engineering is far from being a new field, it's certainly flourishing today. And the latter, I believe, makes other people that are not involved in it wonder what data engineering is all about. And since the new plugin is now available for IntelliJ IDEA, we decided to do a live webinar dedicated to data engineering and developer tooling that they use. Who would be the ideal candidate to do such a webinar? And of course, someone who is a data engineer and a contributor to the tools for data engineers. So please meet Jeff Tang, a data engineer, contributor to Apache CS, Levy and Zeppelin, and also a speaker at conferences around big data. Jeff is currently working at Alibaba Group, and before that, he worked at Hortonworks. Hello, Jeff, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, no matter uh, where you are. Uh, my name is Jeff Zhang. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank everyone to join this webinar. Uh, actually, this is my uh, first time uh, online uh, a live webinar in English. So uh, I just hope that it could be uh, successful. And uh, in one hour later, uh, after this webinar, you will feel that at least you do learn something from this webinar. And uh, it doesn't uh, waste your time. So uh, today's webinar is about uh, the data engineering and the developer tools for big data. Uh, actually, this is a very um, broad topic. So I would not cover everything. But instead, I will uh, share with you with my about my experience in data engineering and uh, what I feel the most important and uh, useful tools or skills for uh, a data engineer. So uh, first, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jeff Zhang. Uh, currently, I work in Alibaba Group as a staff software engineer. Uh, prior to that, I worked in Autodesk, eBay, Pivotal, and Hortonworks. Uh, looking back at my uh, past experience, uh, I often feel lucky that uh, um, I have the privilege to uh, work in these uh, great companies, and uh, uh, I grow a lot in each of uh, in all of them. And uh, I think there's two key things in my career path. Uh, one key word is data. Another is Apache. Uh, I feel uh, lucky that uh, in each company, I always do data-related work, uh, including the data processing, data analytics, and or even build uh, the underlying infrastructure uh, tools for the data engineering. Uh, the other key words is about the uh, Apache. I am lucky that I start to uh, contribute to Apache project uh, since uh, about around uh, 10 years ago, so about uh, in 2009. And now uh, I'm an uh, Apache, uh, Apache member and uh, three PMC of Apache projects. So I believe that uh, I will still uh, work in data and open source community in future uh, because I believe the value of data and open source. Okay, so, so now let's, uh, let's back to today's topic, data engineering and uh, developer tools for big data. So this is today's agenda. Uh, the today's agenda is just, uh, I split into four parts. The first part is about, uh, I will talk about uh, what is data engineering. And the second part, I will talk about uh, uh, the skills or tools for data engineering. And uh, the third part, I will focus two important tools for data engineering, that is uh, Spark and uh, Sampling. So in the last section, uh, we will have uh, Q&A. So uh, first, let's talk about uh, what is data engineering. Uh, before we talk about the, uh, what is data engineering, uh, I will let's first look at the uh, data pipeline. So here is the uh, a diagram about the uh, data, uh, data pipeline. Uh, so le le let's look at first. Let's look at the uh, the left of the diagram. On the left, it is the uh, 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 it is the uh, data source. That is uh, where the, is the data generated. So it might be a web web, web application, or it might be a, a mobile application, or even IoT devices. So um, 
after the, the data is uh, generated, we will have a uh, data acquisition and data processing, data governance. And later, we will have further data rugging. And after the data rugging, there will be uh, two, uh, we will have two usage, usage for the data. One is the uh, BI part, another is the uh, AI part. For the BI part, we will have uh, data visualization and uh, we will build uh, reports or dashboard. For the AI part, we will have a uh, we will uh, train the, uh, we will have model training, and uh, after that, we will have uh, serve the model online. So, uh, so this is a very uh, typical uh, data pipeline. And uh, uh, I'd like to, um, so what is the, uh, what is data engineer in this uh, data pipeline? Actually, we can split this data pipeline in, in, in three parts. On the left part, it is the software engineer. So the, it is the software engineer who builds the web application, mobile application. And after that, it is data engineer. The data engineer collects the data, do, do data processing, data rugging, and the, it is the data engineer to uh, deliver the uh, deliver a well organized and clean the data to the data scientist. And the data scientist will do the work of the BI and AI. So, um, but uh, I think I'd like to clarify that uh, each is this diagram is the idea separation between the software engineer, data engineer, and the data scientist. But uh, in most cases, like in uh, in small or middle sized companies, as a data engineer, you will also do uh, need to do some work of data scientist. And uh, like the building dashboard or, 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 or model chain. So uh, in today's webinar, I will focus on the middle part of this diagram and cover uh, and also for cover a uh, part of the data scientist work. So uh, from the previous data pipeline diagram, we can um, get a conclusion that um, data engineer first, which is a software engineer, right? So it. So data engineer is a software engineer, but with professional skills on data. And the second data, soft, uh, data engineer is, uh, is, a, is a software engineer with understanding of data science, because if you do not understand your data science, uh, you will not uh, do the work very well, because most of the work of data engineer is for the data science, like uh, providing the uh, uh, clean and organize the data to data scientists and or maybe you will build tools for data scientists. So um, now let's just uh, compare the data engineer and the software engineer. So um, for the data engineer, you have to pay attention to uh, four things. The first thing is that um, is data quality because uh, this is data engineering's biggest output. The next thing is the scalability. Um, because data is generated constantly every day, every second. It is uh, undetermined uh, what is the scale of data. So your program should handle the data scalability problem properly. The third thing is uh, uh, agility. So here the agility means that the data pipeline or the tools you build should keep a flexibility to adjust and evolve because the data is generated by upstream, which is the web application, mobile application, or IT devices. And uh, actually, you have no control on that. The data schema may change over time. So, so your program should keep the uh, agility. So the last thing is about the uh, data tracking. Uh, because error will happen. It is very normal for a data engineer to, to handle error. Uh, the important thing is to uh, figure out, uh, figure out uh, what's wrong and recover it as soon as possible. So keep data tracking is pretty critical for, uh, for data engineer. Now let's see uh, the relationship between uh, data engineer and a data scientist. So uh, 
in my opinion, uh, they need we do three uh, three things. The first thing is that they need uh, need to provide clean and uh, well organized data to the data scientists. And the uh, second is that uh, they need we also need to build the BI or AI infrastructure uh, for the data scientists. Uh, besides that, sometimes data engineer, data engineer, we also do the work of data analysts uh, or data scientists, like building dashboard, uh, uh, something like that. Yeah. So data engineering is uh, rising in recent years. Actually, uh, I think there's no uh, data engineering uh, 10 years ago. It is rising due to big data and uh, AI because um, big data bring more technical challenges and it also means more value in data. And AI bring more data consumption. So all of these things cause the rise of data engineering. Uh, yeah, so we, we just talk about, uh, talked about what is data engineering. So next thing I'd like to talk about uh, the skills or tools of data engineering. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the pro programming language. So here I just list uh, four programming languages which is required for data engineering. The top one is SQL, the structure query language. I believe this is um, the must have programming language for data engineering. Besides the language itself, you will also need to learn the uh, database knowledge including the uh, data model, the storage, the index, and et cetera. And the SQL is mostly, uh, is mostly used to into, uh, uh, to into uh, scenarios. One is uh, in ETL, another is in uh, data analysis. Uh, the second language uh, is Java and Scala. Scala. Uh, they all belong uh, to JVN language. So the JVN landscape is a very strong and powerful ecosystem. Uh, you can find many uh, library and tools for building a larger system. The next thing, uh, the next language is Python. Uh, Python has become pretty popular in recent years due to AI. It is widely used by the data analysts and the data scientists. The last language is Shell. So uh, Shell can be used to for uh, some kind of task just by writing less than uh, 100 lines of code, which can be used to glue uh, many uh, subcomponents sub together. So next thing I'd, I'd like to talk about is functional programming. That is uh, widely used by the data engineer. So what is function programming? I, I think many of you may already know that. So here is the definition of functional programming. Uh, functional programming is a programming paradigm. It's a style of building the structure and elements of computer programs that treats uh, computation as the evaluation of mathematical function and avoid side effects. So the key word here is avoid uh, side effects. Uh, the reason why a uh, function programming is suitable for data engineering is because it can solve two critical issues in data engineering. The first is reproducibility. So reproducibility means that uh, given a specific input, you can always get the determined output through the uh, pure function. Reproducibility is important for data engineering because error is normal in data engineering and the real long the job is, is, not, uh, is not rare. So keeping the, keeping the reproducibility is pretty important to ensure the data quality. Um, the other thing is about the, uh, the other thing is that can be, uh, that is benefit from the functional programming is test. Um, we know that usually a data pipeline is a large DAG, which is, chained by many subtasks. So test the whole pipeline is almost impossible. But 
with functional programming, we can just test. Uh, uh, we can just test each subtask. So as long as each subtask can guarantee each do the right work, we can ensure the whole pipeline is correct. So there's many tools and frameworks in data engineering. I I will not talk all of them, but here I just uh, list the three must have learned must have learned the framework based on my experience. So there, uh, so these three frameworks are Hadoop, Hive, and Spark. So Hadoop is actually it is not a single uh, project. It composes uh, several sub projects. Among these uh, sub projects, HDFS is the uh, is the most important in my opinion. So HDFS is actually a distributed file system, which is widely used by many organizations. The architecture of HDFS is pretty uh, straightforward. So it is it is a master slave architecture. Um, name node is the master node which manages the uh, metadata of the file system. So the metadata here means the uh, file system uh, tree structure. Um, the data node is the uh, slave nodes which holds the uh, the real data. The minimum uh, the minimum unit of data is uh, block data block. So the reason I'd like to uh, I'd like to talk about HDFS is back is because that uh, as long as you understanding the uh, the uh, architecture of HDFS, it will be much easier very easier for you to learn other uh, storage system. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, Yang. So Yang is the resource uh, resource schedule system of Hadoop. The architecture of Yang is almost the same as uh, HDFS. The resource manager is the uh, master node uh, that uh, manages the uh, node managers, and the node manager is the uh, worker node, which uh, do the real uh, computation work. Uh, the minimal unit of computation is container. Um, the next tool I'd like to talk about is Hive. So Hive is, I, I believe Hive is the uh, de facto standard of data warehouse uh, system upon the uh, Hive ecosystem. Uh, so, so the user can, uh, here is the diagram about the architecture of Hive. So, uh, so user can access Hive via a command line, Hive Swift server, or Hive uh, web user interface. So, um, and the, cent the central part of this diagram is the key component of Hive. Which is the uh, driver. So the driver is responsible. Uh, it, 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 the, the driver will do the um, passing the uh, CQ and uh, build the query planner and optimize it. And then it will push the uh, planner to the uh, execute, execution engine. So uh, currently, uh, Hive supports three uh, execution engines so that is uh, MapReduce, Test, and uh, a spark. On the right side is it is the metadata. So metadata is in I think it is indispensable for data warehouse system. So the reason I, I talk about the Hive is about its architecture is very uh, very cl classical. So after you uh, get familiar with Hive, it would not be um, difficult for you to learn another uh, circuit framework in the big data uh, area. So um, so now let's go to the uh, third part. Uh, in the third part, I will talk about uh, two things. One is Spark, another is uh, Zipling. So um, first, let's talk about uh, Spark. So here is just a diagram to uh, demonstrate this, the, the uh, Spark ecosystem. In the uh, center part of this diagram is the Spark core. Which provides the uh, RDD API. Upon that, there's several um, high-level API that could be used uh, in different areas. Like the Spark SQL can be used for batch processing, and Spark Streaming is for uh, streaming processing. And ML Spark MLlib is used for uh, machine learning. GraphX is used for uh, graph uh, computation. 
besides that, uh, Spark has very rich data source API. So it can Spark can connect uh, to most of the um, popular data sources like the uh, Hadoop, Kafka, Hive, and it, and etc. So the so next thing I'd like to talk about is the uh, the architecture of Spark. So the architecture of Spark is also uh, the same as the uh, HDFS and the Young Schedule, which is a uh, master slave architecture. Uh, the driver is the uh, master, or the executor is the uh, slaver. The driver will coordinate the uh, task uh, dispatching, and uh, the executor will do the real uh, uh, computation work. So, um, and the Spark job can can run um, can run in, in different uh, cluster environments, such as a standalone, young or Mesos, or even uh, Kubernetes. This is achieved by the cluster manager. So each cluster environment has its own cluster manager. So, um, so why, why, why so many people use Spark in data engineering? Um, I think, in my opinion, there's uh, four main reasons. One is that uh, Spark can be used in multiple areas, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the, uh, in the uh, before, uh, diagram because um, so Spark can be used in batch processing, streaming processing, machine learning, and graph computing. So, uh, second is that uh, Spark has very uh, rich data sources, so it can, uh, we wish make it very easy to consume uh, different data sources and integrate with other, uh, other systems. The third reason is the, uh, the Spark API is functional or uh, programming style. As we mentioned before that the functional programming is very um, suitable for data engineering. The pure function can solve the uh, two main, the, the two issues, reproducibility and the test. The so last uh, but not the least is the uh, high performance of Spark. Compared to MapReduce, uh, Spark's performance has uh, gained significant improvements. So next, I will talk about the uh, classical usage of uh, Spark during each year. So each year, I think each year is the indispensable step for uh, building the warehouse system. As its name implies, each year has uh, three steps, extract, transform, and load. So extract means that um, to read raw data from a single or multiple sources, and then data is transformed. Uh, here the, data, uh, the transformation could be uh, data filtering, aggregation, normalization, or join with other data. And finally, the data is uh, just loaded to other storage system. Usually, um, the, 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 the output data is compressed, structured, cleaned, and uh, reorganized. So this is uh, ETL. Um, here is one uh, simple code snippet about writing each year job in Spark. Here we just uh, read the uh, CSV data and uh, then doing filtering and uh, aggregation. Finally, we write it into, uh, uh, into ORC format. So this is just, uh, yeah. So this is just uh, how, we, how we do each year in Spark. The Spark, is, the, the Spark API is pretty, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty user-friendly and it, it's easy to use. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, is handling bad record. I, I think that this is uh, one thing that most of the, uh, most of the time that people may forget at the beginning, especially for, for uh, for uh, for new uh, for new guys in, in data engineering, um, so data engineer need to keep in keep in mind that uh, the data is out of your control. So you cannot assume the data is always in the right format you expect. 
it is pretty normal that the data is corrupted. So how handle um, the how how to handle this bad record in Spark? So Spark has uh, native support on that. For example, um, when you when you read text for match data, you can specify uh, three different policy for handling bad record. So the first part is permissive. So in this model, Spark will set uh, other file fields to null when it meets a corrupted record and put the uh, malformed string into a new field configured by uh, spark.sql.coroning of corrupted record. The second policy is uh, drop a malformed. So in this model, uh, Spark will just ignore the uh, corrupted records. The third policy is fail fast. So in, in this model, the spark job will just slow exception when it meets corrupted record. So next, let's see a real uh, example. Here we are uh, reading a JSON format, JSON format data. Uh, we can notice that this JSON data has um, two fields, name and age. And uh, here we have three records. But the second one is corrupted, so there's no value associated with the uh, age. And if we run the below um, code snippet, which and we in the, in this code snippet we using the uh, permissive model, and we can get output on uh, like the uh, on the right side. We can see the uh, column name age uh, as the age name for the second car, uh, second record is now and the map found is a map found data is stored in an, into another column uh, uh, which named a uh, corrupt record so that so that you can deep dive into this column for further uh, diagnosis to see uh, whether it is a bug in the uh, upstream or a bug in, in your program So basically, um, I believe that as a data engineer, you need to keep, keep in mind two things. Uh, one is that you have no control on the on the source data, including its format, its schema. So 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 your program should uh, um, should assume that um, sh your program should uh, handle exception properly, and uh, you should keep your program uh, for like the flexible to for adjust and evolve and the second thing is that you have no control on the hardware and network so you need to handle the uh, fault tolerance um, luckily uh, spark has already done most of the work for you so uh, so but, but only using spark is not enough in other places you will still need to uh, uh, you need still to you need still need to pay attention on these things. So, as I mentioned before, that uh, Spark is not the only tool you need for data engineering. Um, it can't do uh, everything in data engineering, so you still need to other tools such as Airflow for uh, assembling a workflow, Kafka for uh, messaging queue, Elastic. Elastic search for real time searching. So, um, and there's other many tools that I didn't uh, list here. Many data engineers will feel um, scared that he has to learn so many things. And, uh, and, uh, and as I, I, to be honest, I think that many of these tools are not easy to use. So, so in my opinion, there's one main barrier for these big data tools uh, that is accessibility and the usability so now let's take uh, we, we we can uh, take spark as an example so actually um many new uh, spark learners that feel that they feel uh, it is hard to access spark environment and it is has hard to um, configure and deploy spark application and also it is hard to integrate with other systems or tools. And uh, in, in, in traditional approach, so here, here I just list the, uh, I just uh, 
here the diagram to illustrate the uh, traditional uh, approach how you develop a uh, spa application so firstly you 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 will write code in ide and uh, you may run it in local mode to make sure it uh, basically works and then package in, it into a uber jar and uh, scp this uber jar into a gateway machine where you can access the spark cluster and then in this uh in this gateway machine you will submit the spark job by uh, through the command line then the job runs so um at the beginning uh, it's very uh it's very um possible that the job fails then you have to check the logs to see uh what's what's wrong and then uh, and then you will go back to your ID and uh, fix the issue and then repeat the, the whole process. So you can see that the whole process is pretty inefficient, right? So, uh, so how can we improve, improve it? That is why uh, Zeppelin comes. So Zeppelin is a web-based web notebook that uh, enable uh, data-driven interactive data data analytics and the collaborative documents with SQL, Scala, Python, and more. So uh, yeah, here is the uh, screenshot of Zipping. In Zipping, you can write code and get data interactively. Uh, in Zipping, you don't need to build the Wubo jar, SCP2 gateway machine, and deploy the SPA application manually. Uh, all of them is done by Zipping. So in Zeppelin, uh, developing a SPA application is pretty uh, efficient and fast. Um, now let's see uh, Zeppelin's architecture. So in the middle size of uh, in in the middle of this diagram is the Zeppelin server, uh, which accepts requests from the client. Um, actually, says the client could could be uh, it, it could be a web browser which communicate with Zeppelin via a WebSocket. And the client could also be a um, Java, Java application that send a REST API to the Zeppelin server. And the Zeppelin server will manage the uh, node and the interpret and will help to launch the uh, interpret process. The so interpret is the uh, component which um, do the uh, real computation task. So uh, Zeppelin uh, supports many uh, kinds of interpret. Here I just list uh, three uh, three major interpret that is spa interpreter, JDBC interpreter and share interpret. And the the interpreter communicate with the Zipping server uh, by uh, RPC protocol. And here I list uh, uh, the major uh, interpret that Zipping supports. Um, actually you can find more interpret in Zipping's uh, website. Mm. So next, I will talk about the uh, some advanced features, uh, uh, advanced features of Zeppelin. Besides, you can run Spark code in Zeppelin. So um, I will talk about them uh, one one by one. The first thing uh, I'd like to talk about is the uh, shared the spare, uh, shared Spark context or Spark session across the language. Um, we know that Spark uh, not only has Scala API, it also has Python API and R API. So uh, in Zeppelin, all these three languages share the same Spark context. So, so what, what does that mean, uh, sharing Spark context across uh, language? Uh, actually, that means data sharing. So uh, for example, you can register uh, one Spark table in, in Scala, and then you can access this table in, in PySpark or, or Spark R. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the inline configuration. So, uh, so actually Zeppelin could be used by uh, multiple users or, or multiple projects, but, but uh, um, different users and different projects will need a uh, different configuration on the Spark, right? So uh, without inline configuration, you will have to create um, different uh, spark interpret. So, so for example, here we have two spark interpret. One is for spark uh, 1.6, another is for uh, spark uh, 
but this is not flex, uh, flexible enough. Uh, inline configuration means that you can um, put the configuration with the uh, code together, so that it will be lay, uh, it will be pretty easy for the user to adjust the uh, configuration. So we can see see how we how we uh, configure the Spark Home in the uh, inline configuration on the uh, right side. Um, another uh, another useful feature of Zeppelin is the inline visualization. So um, most of the data engineer is is back uh, they are back in the, back end engineer. So uh, they are, they are not good at front end. But sometimes you have to build reports or build a dashboard uh, uh, for for the users for your uh, for your stakeholder. Uh, actually, so so actually, Zeppelin can relieve uh, relieve that relieve you from that. There are uh, six um, visualization formats uh, Zeppelin that supports to display uh, to display the table data. That is um, HTML table, uh, bar chart. Pie charge, uh, line charge, uh, area charge, and a scatter, uh, scatter, uh, scatter chart. Yeah. Um, the next feature I'd like to talk about is dynamic forms. And so most of most of the time, you need to um, your program to accept parameters so that you can customize it. Uh, dynamic form is 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 for such purpose. There's three uh, main dynamic forms supported by Zeppelin to accept uh, accept uh, parameters. The first is the uh, text box. Uh, here's just one example where user can uh, uh, type input uh, type input into the text box to customize this uh, SQL statement. The second is um, the job uh, select, which allow you to uh, create a Job down list, and the third is checkbox, which is also uh, very similar as uh, select. So uh, the next feature I'd like to talk about is data exchange uh, class language or class uh, interpreters. So we, we we know that usually um, it will involve multiple tools for one uh, complex task. So how to exchange Data class interpret is pretty important. In in Zeppelin, um, there are two there are two um, data formats that can be shared class interpret. One is string data, another is uh, table data. So you can share a uh, string uh, or share a uh, table data uh, class language and interpreters. So then now let, let's see a, a, a example. So so you so that you can get better understanding. What is that? Um, first, let's see uh, how how we can pass a string from spy interpreter to a JDBC interpreter. So for example, uh, here we uh, here we we put value uh, max h in in into z by call z dot put. So here the Z, uh, Z uh, represents the Zeppelin context, which is a utility class of Zeppelin that provide uh, many advanced features. Here uh, we use Z dot put to uh, to share the data. Um, next, we use the we use that shared data in JDBC interpret. So we can see that here we we use the uh, max edge in in this JDBC uh, uh, JDBC interpret. And uh, now let's see another example about uh, how to uh, share table format data. So here we first we query the database by uh, GDBC interpret, and then we save the um, result into into one variable called uh, bank. Notice that this is a red, uh, red rectangle save equal uh, bank save as equal uh, equal. Uh, Equal to bank. Then, uh, then we can get this table data in in um, table uh, in Python interpret, and we can convert it into a uh, pandas data frame. So after that, uh, you can populate this data frame as as whatever you you would like to do. 
here uh, here we just plot the uh, plot the histogram uh, of the age in in different uh, marital uh, status. So this is a very uh, typical user case that that we we just use the GDBC interpreter to fetch the data and use a Python to do uh, further data analysis. Here we use each inter interpreter for what they are good at and uh, share data uh, between them. So then the next thing I'd like to talk about is the, uh, the REST API. So, um, so actually, uh, you you can uh, you can not only run the code in in web browser uh, in the notebook uh, interface, but also that you can uh, call it REST API. Here I just list um, two most important uh, REST API. You can run the uh, first API is about uh, run the paragraph uh, uh, synchronous or asynchronously, and uh, the second API is about to uh, fetch the paragraph result. Of course, you can uh, find more or less API in the uh, Zeppelin uh, official website. Um, now let's see uh, how to use this uh, kind of REST API. Um, here's one, one, one paragraph that which run uh, one sparse statement, and it can accept one parameter max age. And uh, here's how we how we uh, how we run uh, how we run how we call call the REST API uh, by the uh, curl command. And you will notice that uh, in this curl command, we also pass the uh, parameter max age. And uh, this is the result we get from this REST API. Uh, and uh, from this result, we can see that the paragraph is uh, executed successfully. And uh, we fetch the data of this SQL statement. So, so why why we um, so why we need a REST API and uh, what can REST API be used for? So actually, there's two um, two main uh, two major user usage scenarios. One is workflow. We we know that usually uh, data pipeline is a complex stack which involve many small tasks. So uh, we can actually we can put each subtask into uh, separate paragraphs and it and and uh, assemble then uh, assemble this paragraph into a workflow uh, DAG by uh, other tools like uh, like Air Airflow. So actually uh, if we use Airflow we can create a, a, a Airflow uh, operate for sibling paragraph and assemble them into a larger um, DAG in Airflow. Another user case is the um, integration with other systems. So for example, here we have a, a Java application uh, or a reporting system that uh, and this, this and this Java Java application or report system can uh, call the REST API to run paragraph and uh, fetch the data from the Zeppelin. So this is just uh, two main uh, two main usage for uh, for the REST API. Okay, so uh, the next, I'd like to uh, show you some demos for you. Uh, so this is a, a simple notebook. And uh, now let's see, see what is this. This is spark.conf. This is inline configuration. So in, in this in this paragraph, I can just uh, configure this by interpreter. I can specify uh, where is the uh, where is the uh, Spark home, and what is the model master? Uh, here I just uh, run each in local mode, but uh, you can you can run each in in, in other model like uh, uh, methods, young young class or young client. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, this is about the uh, with this is a Scala code, and we can uh, yeah launch. And this is is the, the Pi Spark. And this is Spark R. Um, so, so the next paragraph is is uh, is it is much more uh, complex. It involves 
which is color code, which will read uh, read a uh, one CSV file and pass it. And this CSV file is about some um, some user user data uh, in, in in bank. And uh, after we pass this data, we will register this. Uh, we will register into uh, into uh, into Spark as one uh, one one temple table. Then, uh, then we can use the Spark SQL to query this query this table. So, for example, um, here we use the uh, use the uh, yeah we just use the uh, we just query it, um, for the uh, for the user that uh, age is less than thirty. And uh, by default, it will show you the uh, table format. Uh, Table format, but we can also show you the uh, bar chart, or pie chart, or area chart, line chart, and scatter chart. So the next example is about the, uh, the dynamic form. We hear the dynamic form is the text box. So for example, let's know. So here the default value is 30, but we can also choose a uh, Another value, for example, we can choose 40. So yeah, after we change this value, it's the paragraph we are wrong uh, automatically. And uh, this is example about the uh, select the job down list. Maybe now let's change it. Yeah, you see, it, in this, this, you, you can notice that this bug, the paragraph is wrong uh, automatically. Yeah, this is about the uh, how to use the uh, checkbox. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, let's unselect this. Yeah. Um. So next thing I'd like to uh, show you is a uh, is the JDBC interpret. First, uh, here the JDBC J, the JDBC is is to connect to the uh, Hive data. Uh, yeah, I think I should first uh, show you how I configure the JDBC. Let's see. You can see that uh, I specify the the driver and the the JDBC UI. You know, this is my uh, local Hive. Uh, and uh, yeah, I also need to specify the dependency. I uh, depend on Hive JDBC and also Hadoop com uh, common. Let's go back. Okay. Um. Yeah. First, let's see. Um. Let's see. Uh, what what table in in Hive? We can see that there are five tables. Uh. First, let's see. Then, uh, we just use very simple uh select star from this from bank, and we can get all the data. And you notice that here I specify saved as equal bank. So that means I'd like to uh, share I'd like to share this data uh, by other interpreters, and here I I I will get this data as a uh, data frame. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the uh, Python interpret. So then I will use uh, Python uh, ggplot library. Uh, sorry, it is uh, plot nine. Plot nine is uh, Python uh, Python library, which is similar as the ggplot in 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 R, so here uh, I just plot the uh, plot the uh, histogram of the age, and uh, in, in different uh, in different uh, mar marital status. The next example is about uh, I I uh, I share the data how to share the data between Spark input and uh, GDBC. So so I just write a very simple uh, uh, command to put put one value. Put, into the uh, into uh, into using this uh, variable max age. So and in JDBC interpret, I will uh, use that uh, variable. Now let's let's run this paragraph. Okay, you can see that you know, right? all the age is equal to uh, uh, eighty three. So uh, yeah, I think this is pretty much about the uh, about the the demo now let's get back okay uh yeah now uh, is about the summary of this uh today's uh, webinar so today we 
we first we talk about the uh, what is data engineering. We talk about the separation between the software engineer, data engineer, and a data scientist, and uh, what is difference between these three roles. Uh, in the second part, uh, we talk about the skills, tools of, of uh, data engineering, especially we talk about uh, programming languages, and uh, also we talk about uh, functional programming, which is very suitable for uh, uh, data engineering. And uh, we also uh, introduce uh, Hadoop, Hive, and Spark. These are uh, very uh, say they are we, uh, widely used in data engineering. And in the third part, I I, I focus on the two uh, two part uh, two two uh, two important tools that is Spark and the Plus Spring. So we 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 also we talk about how to use Spark ETL. And uh, then I talk about the uh, features of Zeppelin and how how that is how, how that can help you to to do work in data, data engineering. Uh, and it's, uh, yes, this, this uh, here I just list uh, several links about the uh, um, about the materials in this uh, in this webinar. So uh, you may know that. Um, JetBrain, uh, JetBrain uh, released uh, uh, big data tools uh, plugin in, in uh, maybe in I think it is in, in last month, and uh, it integrates uh, we integrate uh, Zeppelin into uh, IntelliJ, and uh, um, I personally I I I, I like um, uh, actually you can uh, experience in uh, Zeppelin in IntelliJ, IntelliJ as you as you experience in in a web browser. But uh, um, the big data tools will provide uh, extra uh, functionality that uh, you you can't uh, experience in in web browser. Uh, so the so, so the cool thing is about the the code navigation and uh, and uh, code completion feature that is uh, pretty uh, uh, useful uh, for the data engineer, and it can uh, improve the productivity uh, of of data engineer to develop a uh, spark. Spark creation. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this is the this is all about uh, the things I'd like to talk about today. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so next thing uh, is the Q and A section. All right. Thank you, Jeff, for a wonderful overview and uh, quite a detailed one. Um, we'll check some. Uh, of the questions uh, and um, well people have chance to to submit them maybe I also uh, may share some some um, questions I have uh, before I do that there was a one one question on um, well showcasing their big data tools uh, how it works with Zeppelin and Spark and I was just uh, answering this um, well in the chat form that uh, I intentionally asked Jeff not to try to um, focus on big data tools and instead focus on the open source tools in the area of data engineering. So the webinar is not used to like artificially promote. And I just thought that uh, maybe instead uh, we could, uh, well, if there is an interest and I see it, uh, we, we could try to do another one, another webinar, just to focus it on how uh, big data tools exactly fits their uh, workflow of data engineers and how it helps to collaborate to work with Spark and Zeppelin. All right. Um, yeah, well, um, yeah, let, let, let's let uh, all their uh, attendees uh, some give some time to ask questions and meanwhile um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe could you call, uh, elaborate a little bit on um, on the difference between um, Scala and Python uh, for data engineering. So, uh, what is the main difference? Why some people prefer Scala and the others uh, Python? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. So, oh, sorry. Uh, I think uh, it is. Um, it it depends uh, your your background. So, uh, if you are uh, uh, Java engineer 
and uh, you may uh, prefer to use uh, C, C, uh, Scala language. And uh, if you if you come from uh, your background is about um, data analysis, so you may prefer to use Python. And uh, the second thing is about uh, um, the, uh, the second thing is about uh, what is um, uh, where you integrate with your uh, Spark creation with other system. So most of the time, uh, uh, sometimes you will uh, your your Spark creation you need to uh, integrate with other systems. So if if the other system is 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 write, written in in JVM languages, then it's better to uh, write a Spark creation with uh, using a Scala. But if you uh, if if you'd like to integrate uh, your Spark job with some uh, some Python libraries, then it should be better for uh, to do uh, uh, to do uh, to using uh, PySpark. For example, if you if you uh, write a Spark job to fetch data from the uh, from the uh, Hadoop, and uh, then you'd like to uh, using uh, using Python some Python library to visualize, or or, or maybe you you'd like to uh, using the uh, scikit-learn to do machine learning, then it's it better to use the uh, PySpark. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Um, 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 another similar question about st stream processing and batch processing. What's your take on that? Uh, actually, actually, I think that uh, the major uh, usage of Spark is still in, in in for batch processing, but. Uh, I think streaming uh, is also very uh, um, important as, as as we know that uh, uh, we we need to get the uh, get the in, uh, the value of the uh, the, uh, the value of the real time data is, is pretty important, right? So um, so uh, for and uh, you uh, maybe you uh, people know that. Uh, Recently, um, DataBricks they they uh, they released a new library called um, Delta, and the Delta is just for a real-time uh, data warehousing system. So in in this uh, in this library, uh, you uh, they use the Spark streaming job. Uh, they will run the Spark streaming job to uh, continuously uh, con uh, ingest the data and uh, and uh, and feed the data into the uh, data lake. So uh, it can uh, speed up the, the, the whole process and uh, provide a real time insight for for the uh, for the business uh, department. So uh, I believe that uh, the, the the batch and the streaming it, it, it is uh, uh, it is both important, but uh, batch is uh, currently batch is the uh, the major uh, major player. Yeah. Um, thank you. And um, here's the question uh, from Rob. Um, how does uh, Zeppelin compare to Jupyter? Oh, yeah. I, I, I often uh, get this question. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, I would say that uh, Zeppelin is suitable for data engineer and uh, Jupyter is suitable for the uh, data scientists. Uh, because they uh, simply come from the uh, big data com community, so uh, it is written in uh, in J uh, Java language, and it uh, and uh, and uh, and you know that uh, uh, many of the big data tools is in the uh, JVM uh, JVM uh, landscape. So uh, so simply simply can uh, simply can be integrated with uh, the big data ecosystem uh, uh, easily. And the Jupyter comes from the Python community, and it supports the Python language very well. And if you if you are doing uh, data science work like uh, mach doing machine learning, then I would su suggest you to uh, to use Jupyter. But if you are data engineer and you your major work is doing uh, data data analysis and uh, or ETL, then I would suggest suggest you to use uh, Zeppelin. Hello. Um. Yep. Uh. Forgot mm -hmm. to unmute myself. Thank you. Uh. Jeff. 
Um, another question here is, um, um, are there any tools for workflow management, uh, like, for example, to ingest files or do processing? Um, uh, so, so actually there's a lot of uh, uh, workflow frameworks. I think maybe the most uh, popular one is uh, Airflow. And uh, I know there's uh, another uh, uh, one framework used widely that is uh, at Carbon. That is, um, I believe it is from the LinkedIn. The LinkedIn. And uh, regarding the, 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 the specific uh, problem you mentioned, the interest ingesting a file i uh actually i i i may i may didn't get the the, the point but uh, i think these these kind of uh all of these uh workflow uh schedule can 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 be uh can be done for for this task um right um Another question. Uh, speaking of the REST API you've uh, mentioned uh, in your slides, um, is it for? Is it can it be used for in production, or is it something that uh, can can be used uh, in like uh, non-production environment? Oh, uh, so yeah. So 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 uh, the REST API I mentioned in the in the webinar is in the uh, in the mass branch of Spring, and uh, it will be released in the next version of Spring. It might be released in in next month. So uh, I, I so if you would like to try it in, in production, I would suggest you to uh, wait for the release. Uh, the next release of Zipping. Yeah. Yep. Um, another question. Um, let me read it. How can we make faster Spark job submit and set properties in map reducing jobs regarding mapping and reducing more fast? Uh, so it is a question about the tuning the Spark job, right? Um, yeah, right now I, I only can read it and, um, okay. yeah. um so maybe yeah, so, let me go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of things you can do to tune the, uh, smart job. Like, uh, you can allocate more resources and, uh, you can, uh, I, so, um, basically, if, uh, First, if you would like to uh, optimize uh, Spark job, first I would like to suggest you to uh, use a uh, Spark uh, Spark SQL uh, framework instead of the Spark RDD because the Spark SQL uh, API will do the optimization uh, query optimization for you first. And uh, besides that, you can uh, uh, you can configure your Spark question uh, by uh, by lots of uh, properties such as uh, uh, you can allocate more memory, more CPU cost to your Spark question. So, um, so last thing I would like to suggest is that uh, if you find your Spark job is pretty slow, then it is better to first to look at the Spark web UI. So in the Spark web UI, you can find a lot of metrics there. Then you can uh, you can find uh, where is the bottleneck. Then uh, after you find the bottleneck, you can you can uh, tune your Spark uh, application uh, uh, more uh, more uh, properly. Yeah. Right. Uh, the next question regarding functional programming and pure functions as a part of the data pipeline, does it have a bigger impact on development efficiency than say using test driven development with a non functional language? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. So regarding the functional programming, which you also mentioned in your slides, and like pure functions as a part of the data pipeline, does it have a bigger, big impact on development efficiency for data engineers? Rather, or in, like instead of uh, saying using test-driven development with a non-functional language? Uh, so, yeah, right. I, 
Yeah, sure. So the the uh, functional programming can uh, can improve the productivity of the data engineer, as I mentioned in in the uh, in the slides, uh, because it can uh, solve two things. One is the reproducibility, right? So uh, another is a test, because I believe that the the, the test. Uh, how to test the the program? How to test the the code in data engineering is pretty um yeah it it is pretty uh difficult, but in programming, uh in functional programming we we can just uh, test the the function of the pure function, and uh, as long as we guarantee the uh, correctness of the pure function, we can guarantee the the correctness of the whole pipeline. Um, all right. Um, follow up question to workflow tools. What is the workflow uh, from trying out stuff to actually deploying stuff with Airflow from a Git repository? Um, CNP from the notebook to an editor refactor and commit. Like I, if I got it right, the question is about the workflow from a like prototype of your job uh, to actual deployment? Uh, prototype of the workflow to 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 production, what? Right? Um, I believe um, like um, first we like, I, I suppose a data engineer may start uh, from a like from prototyping a job, like for example, using Zeppelin, then over yeah. time uh, it uh, gets a part of the production. So what is the normal workflow here? Oh yeah, I see. So uh, actually, uh, yeah, you, you, you can do the uh, prototype in Zeppelin. And besides that, you can also, uh, uh, um, you can also uh, use in Zeppelin for, for production. Uh, but uh, Zeppelin is not suitable for uh, for long pieces of code. Uh, for uh, so you you can just uh, you can just write the, the um very um maybe maybe one uh one hundred or two two hundred lines code in Zeppelin uh, notes. Uh, if if it is a very complex problem, I would suggest you to write the uh, complex business logic in in traditional IDE. So, but in simply notebook, you can just write the uh, the uh, the workflow. So, for example, um, we have uh, for example, we uh, now, now, now let let me uh, show you. Maybe I can show you this ETL work. Um, I, yeah. For example, uh. So, so in, in this ETL example, we uh, we use a Spark uh, Spark API to read the data and uh, do uh, do data manipulation uh, to uh, to data transformation and uh, then uh, load, write it into uh, other system. So, uh, in in simply we can we can just write this uh, this piece of code, but it if if it involve a uh, complex business logic, so so. Usually the complex business logic is, is here, right? How to field, how to grid. So for, for this piece of code, we can actually write thing in the uh, in in uh, in in traditional IDE, right? And you can write you can write thing in the uh, in IntelliJ. And uh, you and also this this piece of code is pure function, right? And you can test thing in the in in the uh, IntelliJ. And uh, then after that, you can uh, export this. Uh, you can ex you can uh, in Zeppelin, you just need to uh, uh, specify the dependency on on this on this uh, library. So that that means you can combine the traditional ID and the Zeppelin to work together to build the the whole uh, whole uh, to build the whole pipeline. Yeah, I hope that can can explain to you. Yep. Um, I don't see more questions uh, right now, and um, 
we already 10 minutes uh, over and I think um, so just uh, let everyone know um, you can ask uh, any questions even after the webinar ends uh, using Twitter or email or you can just find the blog post where we announced the webinar and, and just post uh, in the comments uh, your questions um, and um, we'll do our best to, to answer them all. And that's all the time we have for uh, questions today. So thank you, Jeff, again um, for a great presentation and for finding time. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. It is my uh, pleasure to uh, to give this uh, talk. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. And um, yeah, in case you are involved in uh, data engineering, make sure to give a try to our new plugin. Um, and if you do so, please uh, share the feedback with us so we can make it even better. Thanks, everyone. Take care.